Hello, and welcome to our latest in our series of Green Bank Telescope webinars. I'm Jay Lockman, and I'm sitting in today for the director, Jim Jackson, who is in a program review. So I'll start by giving a little bit of recent GBT news and then turn it over to our speaker today for the presentation. Um, in the news, um, you all should have received your proposal dispositions earlier this week. They went out, I believe, on Tuesday. Uh, the GBT is operating well, and we've had some great three millimeter weather. So we're off to a good winter in that respect. Um, as I mentioned, Jim Jackson is in an NSF program review right now, which is reviewing our plans for the coming few years. And we're having the Jansky lecturer here tomorrow night, um, Thursday, for the annual Jansky lecture. We're making preparations for the American Astronomical Society meeting in uh, New Orleans in January. There will be a special session on GBT large surveys of the interstellar medium and star formation, and that will be Tuesday afternoon, June 9th. If you have any presentations that you'll be making at the AAS, we'd love to advertise them. I'll put contact information in the chat window, and you can reach Jill Molesky, who is our press officer, with information, and we'd love to know uh, what you're doing with the GBT and how you are uh, presenting it at the AAS meeting. As I say, I'll put that in contact information in the chat window in a few moments. Our speaker today is Yushin Lin from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. She'll be talking about physical and chemical conditions of early stage star forming cores. Just to let you know, this is being recorded and will be able to be viewed later on today. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A box in the lower part of your screen, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Dr. Lin, take it away. Thank you, Jay. So I'll start to share my screen. So can you see it in full screen? Looks good. OK. So thank you for having me, uh, for having me here today. Uh, it's actually my first publication using GBT data. So I'm really glad we, I have the chance to present the works. Um, so I will start with briefly introducing the characteristics of the targets in interest here, which are pre-stellar cores. And we know that dense cores are the fundamental unit for solar type star formation. And pre-stellar cores is actually a subcategory of starless cores. If you look at the figures here, the arrow downwards shows the evolution of starless cores. So pre-stellar core compared to a prior stage of starless core, it has a more centrally concentrated density profile as shown in this figure, as well as a more severe molecular depletion. So in accord with this uh, centrally concentrated density profile, we expect the gas temperature of the pre-stellar cores show a inward show an inward decrease decrease towards the center. This is because the main heating um, me mechanisms for pre-stellar cores are interstellar radiation field and cosmic rays. So in the very center of the core, where the where the gas densities are quite high, the dust and gas thermal coupling become significant, and this will efficiently drag the gas temperature down to several Kelvin. So the figures here shows the ob observed um, ammonia results towards a prototypical crystalline core L1544. So this work is published a decade ago, which shows that the temperature drop is quite drastic, uh, reaching down to six Kelvin in the very center. So, so cold and dense are these uh, most prominent physical features of pre cores. course. These physical uh, properties would have chemical consequences because these are the two factors uh, favoring the molecular depletion and the deuterium fractionation. So I will not go into details of the chemical reactions of deuterium, but I would like to introduce these uh, figures down below, which shows a typical dust grain configuration in the very center of pre cores. So from this figure, we can see that there are multiple ice layers uh, coating on the silicate core. And the outermost layer 
have already gone through this successive hydrogenation. So the simple molecules have already formed myosinol and formaldehyde, which are two parent mo molecules for building the complex organic chemistry. And so basically understanding the chemical processes associated with pre-style cores will really build the foundation for us to understand the chemical evolution um, during the course of protostar um, formation. So basically pre-style cores are the starting point for us to bio-tailor the chemical models so we could explain the origin and the evolution of this uh, molecular species. And in this uh, specific work, we focus on ammonia. And why do we uh, care about ammonia? So ammonia lines have been used as an excellent temperature probe since decades ago. So it, the inversion lines, the spectroscopic um, properties of its inversion lines makes it an excellent thermometer for the molecular clouds, especially these lower uh, inversion transitions can probe the um, relatively low temperature associated with the crystal course. And in terms of its chemical properties, um, what makes it interesting is because we have this puzzling observational fact of ammonia that it does not show as the other um, carbon bearing molecules or even nitrogen bearing molecules that it does not show this uh, molecular depletion in the very center of pre cell course. So if you look at the figures here in the red, the gray lines are showing the chemical modeling results um, of varying different um, parameters governing the abundance of ammonia. And we can see that no matter how, uh, how we vary these uh, parameters, we always have a depletion of the ammonia in the very center of the core. Well, the observations, which is shown as the blue dashed line here, it actually shows a minor uh, increment of the ammonia abundance in the very center of the core. So we need to understand the puzzling uh, result of the observation and the predictions from the chemical models. And we, uh, I'm not saying that the chemical models we have for this pre-style course are perfect because there are also other uncertainties uh, related to these parameters governing the abundance of ammonia. But it is important that we collect more observational results, which are high angular resolution ammonia abundance results towards pre-style course so that we could further uh, tailor the chemical model and refine the parameters in a uh, guided way. So now I come to the main part of this work. So we have three cores observed by GBT and VLA. These include one Stardis core and two Pristella cores. So the MIPS shown here are the high angular resolution molecular hydrogen MIPS in color scale. And the contours are showing the integrated intensity MIPS of the ammonia uh, one one line. So this work, this method of using ammonia to probe the temperature is a rather conventional approach um, to understand the thermal structure of pre cell cores. But in this work, we try to utilize the most advanced image combination technique. So we really push the image fidelity um, when it comes to the combination uh, method. So for the ammonia data cubes, we use this uh, joint deconvolution um, plus uh, emerge in the final final step to conserve uh, to make the flux level conser conservative, and this method is actually benchmarked by a model assisted clean in Casa. So we are testing these two uh, different ap approaches of combining the two data sites in order to have a uh, combined ammonia data cube of highest fidelity achievable. And in order to have a high angular resolution abundance map, we need to have a hydrogen a molecular hydrogen map of matchable angular resolution. So for this, we have to use the mid infrared extinction method. And I will explain this a bit later in the following slides. But we, for this method, we actually update the conventional one, and because we use some benchmark in order to make sure that the extinction method for different cores are giving consistent results to be compared with. 
So for the methodology paper, um, where we can we compute this uh, combined some millimeter, some millimeter map in order to get the extinction method, I refer you to this uh, methodology paper we published last year. So it is uh, a method um, which can be adopted for combining the ground-based barometer observations with the space telescope observations uh, of the continuum image taken from the uh, taken towards the molecular clouds. So I will briefly introduce the extinction method and because it has this strong intrinsic uncertainties, we have to benchmark it using this uh, combined uh, submillimeter sub map. So the figure in the upper panel shows the a general picture when interstellar radiation field goes through a cold and dense core. So if you look at the one component, uh, radiative transfer an equation, we actually have three components. We have a, a foreground emission, a background emission, and these are attenuated. Uh, the background emission is attenuated by this cold and dense core so that uh, it becomes dimmer. And these two components add up to the observed intensity level. This is basically the equation used for probing the hydrogen column densities from mid-infrared mid extinction method. But we have uncertainties associated with the foreground emission level estimate, as well as the background emission level estimate. Basically, the foreground and background emission cannot be properly uh, distinguished and for the foreground, we have to assume a constant level. And this constant level naturally comes with an upper limit, which is the most extincted part, the, cent uh, the, mo the innermost region of this cold dense course. It, the intensity at that location naturally set an upper limit for the foreground emission. And for the background, we have to use some interpolation and smoothing kernels in order to um, give a view of the varying uh, background level. So the, basically we have a rather free floating background emission level and we tend to overestimate the background as well as uh, underestimating the foreground level. Both these two factors would add to the fact that we would underestimate the hydrogen column density from this traditional extinction method. So in order to mitigate this issue, we use the ground-based bolometric maps. Um, the ground-based bolometric maps, uh, for example, those taken from JSMT Scuba 2, it has a, a rather good uh, resolution compared to the Space Telescope from Herschel. But the problem with all the ground-based bolometer maps is that they are missing the Cindy structures. This is associated with the, extract, uh, with the subtraction of the atmospheric, atmospheric contamination um, in the raw data reduction process. So we um, inevitably have this uh, problem with the ground-based bolometric maps alone. This is where our combination technique comes into the picture that we combine this GCMT scuba 2 map with the Planck map at the, at the, at the same frequency so that we have a combined map shown in the lower, shown in the first uh, map here that still preserve the high angular resolution of the SCUBA2 observations, while also it, it has this extended emission um, probed by the Planck map. So starting from this uh, combined map, as well as a temperature map built from the spectral energy distribution from the Herschel band, we can derive a uh, intermediate product uh, of hydrogen column density map. It has an intermediate um, angular resolution of 14 arc second. And based on this and comparing this map with the opacity map from the traditional extinction method, we could arrive at a calibration plot where we compare, we compare the predicted um, opacity map at eight micron from this uh, 14 uh, arc second angular resolution map to um, really uh, see what are the difference between these two set of measurements. And we then uh, apply this uh, constant scaling factor to this uh, 
opacity map at eight uh, micron from the extinction method and arrive at this five arc second molecular hydrogen maps. So for all these three cores, we, we did the same thing, which means that we bring the uh, hydrogen column density map of these three cores to be benchmarked by the Herschel and the uh, Sigma 2 images. So now they are having uh, similar um, intrinsic uncertainties without uh, being biased by the different uncertainties associated with their background, foreground emission level estimates. So this is the, the way we derive this high resolution hydrogen column density map. And with this column density map, we can now proceed to invert these column densities to be the uh, core density profiles. So the figure in the left shows the measured data points and the model feed uh, of a Bona abbott like density profile in red. So, and in the, in the red uh, panel, the three core comparisons between the three cores are shown. So we have a progressively larger densities at all radii for these three cores, which is ideal for us to test against the ammonia depletion behavior. And now from the combined, I will now go, uh, will now introduce the combination method uh, of GBT and VLE data. For the technical details, you can check our paper online. And from this combined ammonia maps, we can derive the parameter maps, which are um, the excitation temperature of ammonia, the column density, kinetic temperature, line width, and central velocity. And for this uh, computation, we actually adopted a um, Bayesian framework. So this is critical because for the temperature um, job that we expected to see, the job is usually within one or two Kelvin range, which means that the data points which have this large uncertainties of fitting errors should be abandoned from the future analysis. Now, when we have this kinetic temperature map, we can compare between the three sources and see if, if we have this temperature drop as, ex as expected and how they compare with the case of ALF 1544. So from this figure, we can see that all the temperature drops are minor. So they are within one Kelvin. Um, L1517b is showing the largest kinetic temperature. And in order to understand the variation of these temperatures, we then conduct the full radiative transfer modeling for the uh, hydrogen, uh, for the dust temperature, starting from the uh, high resolution uh, hydrogen maps. Um, if so using that density profile and setting up a standard intercellular radiation field, we can arrive at this dust temperature profile for the three cores. And shown in the figure here in the right, there are two vertical lines. So the outer vertical line is showing the effective mapping radius of our ammonia observations, and the inner line is showing the uh, critical density where the dust and the gas coupling become significant. So, and in this figure, the dash dotted line is showing the mass average temperature because this, from the ammonia observations, we are actually seeing the line of sight mass average temperature. It cannot probe the, the specific temperature at a certain radii because we are seeing the projection effect. And from this kind of experiment, we can say that this minor drop of temperature comes naturally with the data site, and it also um, coincides with the standard inter intercellular radiation field. So these cores are emerging in this uh, rather standard radiation field. And so in order to, uh, from this kind of experiment, we could also say that in order to see a more drastic temperature drop, we will need more, um, higher angular resolution observations, um, as well as we need to extend the mapping radius to the point where we could still see uh, decent ammonia emission. Now coming to the abundance variations of ammonia, the figures here shows the, fun uh, shows the variation of um, ammonia column density as a function of molecular hydrogen column densities of the three cores. And in order to parameterize this uh, trend of uh, distributions, we use this segmented land model. So in the low 
um, hydrogen column density regimes, we use the line, um, we use the linear function to characterize its variation. And then up to some critical um, cutoff value, we use another uh, linear function to characterize its um, uh, variations. And from this kind of experiment, we see that for one of the cores, L429, we do have this abundance variations when the hydrogen column densities reach up to eight um, times 10 to the 22. So this means that we have a moderate depletion of ammonia abundance associated with this most advanced core. And we actually had a work published last year on, on one uh, advanced pre-style core, HMM1. Um, so in that work, uh, Hame showed that there is a more drastic abundance drop of ammonia at the center of this core. And we can now compare the cutoff densities where we see this minor drop of abundance of ammonia to this uh, previous work, which shows a more significant decrease. And we can see that this, this means that for the three cores we are probing, together with the HM, uh, result of HMM1, we actually resolve a progressive ammonia depletion behavior. And this is as a function of core central density and essentially as a function of the core evolutionary stages. So, okay, this is the end of my talk. I'll leave you with my conclusion part. And if you want to check the technical and analysis details, please check our online version. And I can take any questions and comments now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't you leave your conclusion slide up there in full screen and okay. please submit questions in the box to the lower right. And we have a question already. Um, at eight microns, do you take into account the fact that the absorption depth is diminished by the presence of scattered light, invisible core shine effect. If not, you should check, and then a reference to the fever, because this might change your tau eight microns by a very large factor. Yes, that is a good point. I think uh, in the previous work by Yoma Haju, he discussed this effect of uh, scattering, um, the effect of scattering when deriving the uh, opacities. Um, I think the conclusion of that is it really depends on the emission level of the eight micron uh, extinction mice. So I think we do test that towards these three cores and plus the core HM1 in previous publication. The we 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 I think we reached on, on the conclusion that it does not affect the opacity at n micron that significantly. And because we do not have a, a good measure on the scattering, the on, on the optical um, properties of these dust grains, so I'm not sure how to um, assess that in a quantitative way. Okay, thank you. Um, and here is a comment related to the previous question. Can you explain the offset between ammonia and the column density of H2 peaks in some of your cores? The offside. Um, yeah, that looks like a good example of the one you had right there. Uh, this one, you mean? The... Yes. It looks like yeah. there's an offset between the peak of the hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, and the ammonia. Yeah, uh, so this is the integrated intensity maps. It, it cannot be strictly translated to the column densities, but it does reflect the fact that we see some minor offsite between the peak of the ammonia emission and the hydrogen column density map. But if you look at the kernel density estimate between these two quantities for this specific core L6942, uh, the data points that shows this offside are not dominant at, at these uh, large column densities. So it shows an invariant abundance for most of the data points. Um, so for this offside, I would say it's a depletion effect. But if you look if you look at it statistically, it does not stand out as the case of L429. 
Uh, let me uh, ask a question because uh, mm -hmm. see if my, my understanding is correct that you were expecting to see evidence of ammonia depletion towards the center of the cores, but it doesn't yeah. show up in the total column density. It shows up instead in the ratio of the column density of ammonia to the, um, actually the volume density of ammonia to that of molecular hydrogen. Is that correct? Um, I, I'm not sure what you mean because this the map showing the offside is the integrated intensity map of ammonia overlaid on hydrogen column density maps. So, okay. yeah. We do see evidence of depletion of ammonia in the highest volume density regions. Um, yes, the, the, but this really depends on, uh, depends on how the how you translate the, the result because uh, if you if you I think it would make more sense if you look at this kernel density maps because it's reflecting most of the data points. Uh -huh. But if you look at the maps, first of all the integrated intensity maps cannot be directly translated to the column density map. Second second of all we, we are not sure how large is the difference between the offsite. So it could okay I, yeah. Yeah, I, I see. I see mm -hmm. what you're saying. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question. If there's another question, a short question out there. Uh, let's wait a few moments. Well, it looks like there are no open questions left. So um, let me remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and can be viewed later. And I'd like to thank Dr. Lin very much for this presentation. Uh, we will not be having a webinar two weeks from now, so please join us four weeks from now on December 6th for the next one in this series. Jean-Luc Margot from UCLA will be presenting a SETI talk, Are We Alone? New Estimates from Their SETI Data. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and goodbye.